America, it's like I feel like we build our lives to be as comfortable as possible, but perhaps that's not actually the best way to live or, or to be happy, really. You're not made of sugar is a very famous Dutch <laughs> expression. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, because they will get out and ride in almost any weather. The kids are from a very early age are exposed to the elements and taught to be resilient. I think this is this is part of the happiness puzzle that uh, that we're trying to put together. That's something that's really nice about this place. Mm -hmm. just, you know, you hear people's like footsteps. The yeah. birds in the trees. Yeah, yeah. Here with some new friends, uh, Melissa and Chris. Frontlet, and we're here in Delft. You guys moved here how long ago? About two and a half years in February of 2019. We wow, so you just came right before the, uh, the pandemic and yeah. actually... Uh, really forced to get to know the city quite quickly and very intimately. <laughs> not a bad place to be hiding no. out, though. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> so we're just going to just ride around and show us the city and tell us a little about what you're doing and, and how you're maybe trying to help bring some of this like Dutch culture to other places and, and help them understand like why it works. I'm particularly interested as somebody that's into bikes and really trying to advocate for changing the way that cities are, are set up, retrofitting some of these ideas makes mm -hmm. a lot of sense. And, and you guys have spent a lot of time learning about that and learning practical ways to do that. A lot of Delft was built after the Second World War, was initially very car oriented and has since been retrofit, and, and so there's a lot that can be transferred to other parts of the world. I think a lot of times when people look at the Netherlands, they get caught up in the fact that it's been here forever and how perhaps it's, it's not relatable, but cities can change. The city did change. We'll see areas that used to be very car dominated while we're recycling around. Use it as a point of inspiration to see how your cities can be adapted and changed. Well, I really appreciate you guys taking the time with us and let's uh, go for a ride. Sounds good. So this is a uh, school up here on the right. I noticed you have these like the, the bike, the bike buses. What, what do you call yeah. those things? Yeah, so these are here. Oftentimes they're taking the kids to uh, other daycares if they're going to different centers and but they go to school here so it becomes a really convenient way to move I think six or eight children at a time pretty wild yeah I mean, those are those sort of scenarios where you say uh, no but you must have a car for that yeah and the Dutch say oh we've got a plan for that we can figure <laughs> that out I mean, from kindergarten up, when the kids go to, on a field trip or they go to gym class where the gym's off-site or a swimming pool, yeah, all of them cycle together, you know, there's no school bus uh, right, right. to take them. So they all put on high-vis vests so that they know they're together as a group and, you know, yeah. 20 or 30 of them will cycle together a couple kilometers and it must save the school tons of money. And you can see it's also a little bit of delivery hour, so we have to negotiate some space with the uh, with some trucks, but the nice thing is with the roll-up curbs, they can roll up out of the way so there's still room on the cycle path for people to get by. Is there a specific time that deliveries are, are made usually? Or? It's encouraged, but it's not enforced. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I know that was one of the things they were talking about in New York, setting specific times or potentially even offering incentives for trucks to make deliveries off hours and that sort of thing. Well, and in the city center of Delft, because it is so old, they are looking at new ways of dealing with logistics and how to transition to more maybe electric, uh, like cargo bikes and such, or specific delivery times and delivery areas because a lot of the bridges are very old. And so the amount of money that needs to be invested to allow for upgrades is, you know, it's a big chunk of the city's budget that could be put to other more necessary investments. Not that historic preservation isn't, but right. you can make a, bit, a bridge last a little longer if a big transport truck isn't rolling over it every day. I mean, I don't know the exact numbers around it, but I would imagine that the money that's invested in a cycle track will last 10, 15, 20 years longer than that invested into a roadway. So this entire corridor is about two and a half kilometers long. Until 10 years ago was an elevated railway viaduct. So the two train tracks that came in and out of the city were on this big concrete structure that cut the city in two. And uh, there was all kinds of noise when the trains would come into into the city and in the early 2000s they they came up with a plan to bury the train tracks uh, build this new station that we're going to go go and see and reclaim a lot of this space for canals green space and only two lanes of motor traffic this viaduct it was a two kilometer chasm through the city they could open it up and create new park space they built new housing new office space it's it's really opened up the city it's a transformational project it cost over a billion euros Wow. and nearly bankrupted the city, but, but at the end of the day, you know, it's turned Delft into a much better place.
I mean, if you can imagine, this is this is exactly where it was, an elevated, you know, North American style elevated highway, if you will, but right. for trains that were rolling through. And I wonder, was the population uh, growing the demand? It's insane, the, the frequency of the trains here. I mean, right now they're running on like eight minute headways. Wow. Uh, uh, between The Hague and Rotterdam, passing through Delft. That's one thing I certainly noticed, that the train system is great and it's really easy to use. Loads of bike parking. Oh, so much bike parking. <laughs> Just, this is something that we're really missing. New York, we have pretty good trains and there certainly has its trouble and that sort of thing and they're working on it, but, but we don't have bike parking. And I think this dramatically reduces the utility of the train system. Let's go down and see the bike parking. And uh, try not to get in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, uh, there's a lot of interest in Europe as well around, around cycle parking at stations. So it's something that I think both Chris and I in our day jobs get more and more inquiries about and our experts are being asked, you know, how do they supply this? Because there's, up until now, there's been a lot of look at like getting bikes on buses, for example, or bikes on trains when you have that ability. But one of the things that they recognize very early on here is there's a limit to how many bikes you can get on a train. And when you've got 50% of all train journeys starting by bicycle, there's just right. not the capacity for bikes. For sure. You lose the capacity for the passengers themselves. So uh, even just, we often say even just starting small. Uh, so Vancouver, for example, was starting to build uh, facilities at their stations and for 30 to 50 bikes, which, you know, compared to what we're gonna see, <laughs> seems very meager, but it's a good start to try to con uh, connect those trips a bit more. So yeah, this is Delft's main bike parking that we're entering into and they actually have two supplementary spots because this one is always full so wow. you'll you'll see the counters above most of them in red will say VOL which is full or close to let's uh, ride down here Yeah. This is uh, this is really something. Do, do you feel that this also protects it against death pretty well, or it assists? So it wouldn't say we wouldn't say by any stretch that there is absolutely zero theft. But having the attendants on staff, having their cameras here to keep a, keep eye on people's for public safety and for social safety. Uh, generally, people will prefer to use a space like this because they know their bike is amongst hundreds of other thousands of other bikes. So the the population of Delft is round about a hundred thousand. Hundred thousand people yeah. and. New York City is, I think, eight million or something like that. Yeah. Recently, they're talking about putting in a handful of bike parking spaces at the Grand Central Terminal. Mm -hmm. uh, do, you, do you know how many are here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Says, yeah. So the facility we're standing in is 5,000. The day they opened it, it was almost at capacity. So they very quickly got building a second overflow facility, which is wow. another 3,000. That one filled up so quickly, they recently opened a third. That's 2,000, so in total there's 10,000 bike parking spaces for a city of 100,000 people. Yeah. New York City, you got some work to do, okay, <laughs> just uh, to put it lightly. And you guys are studying these sort of topics as well, right? So exactly. mm -hmm. if, if you're trying to figure it out, you can talk to them as well, right? I mean, that's, that's part yeah. of the work that you do yeah. as well, right? Exactly, yeah. It's not an accident that these bike parking exist, it's because the transport planners have specifically chained the bicycle and the train as a one continuous mode of transportation that 650,000 people per day use. Rather than put their bikes on the train, they have a they cycle to the train station, they drop their bike here, tap the card, get on the train, and then on the other end of the journey, they use the same card to borrow a shared bicycle right. uh, for the last mile of their trip. So the bike train bike is a really convenient, fast, inexpensive, door-to-door -door mode of transport that's used by hundreds of thousands of people in the Netherlands every day. The hardest thing is just remembering where you left your bike. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Speaking about that, just like complete system and how things interface, it's so critical. The very first place we start is understanding the network. Where are people living? Where are they traveling to? How do you want them to travel to that space? And then designing the network for it, be that walking, cycling, uh, public transport, or also cars as well. And thinking about how those all work together not just about getting people to, to and from work, which is what a lot of focus tends to be on, especially in North America, but also how do you get them to the shops, how do you get them to health services, how do you get them to school. And a lot of these things do take a lot of time to implement as well, right? You know, people think that the Netherlands is always this way, they always had bike infrastructure and stuff <laughs> like that, but the reality is it started way, uh, well, it started you know, in the 70s or... Yeah, in the 60s and 70s is sort of when they started really thinking about it, but oftentimes 
a lot of what we have here in Dallas and in other cities as well only really got built in the 90s. Half of all the cycle lanes that exist in this country have been built since 1996. Wow. That's in the last 25 years. So when you say, yeah, this takes time, of course it does. But now the Netherlands took 25 years to establish the best practices around design. And then they spent 25 years building out a nationwide network. And, yeah. and we can skip the trial and error part now. The Dutch have done that for us elsewhere right. in the world. Right. And this is an area where you see a lot of innovation happening in the Netherlands. Municipalities are renting out storefronts and, and repurposing it as bike parking in the city center to give people a place to leave their bike. How many cars can you fit in an area? How many bikes can you fit in the area? That's the potential customers that you can actually accommodate in your area. I mean, all the stats around biking to shop is that um, although when we are cycling to a shop we might not spend as much money in one visit, we're spending money more frequently and the same goes for when you're arriving on foot or public transport. Their stops are shorter, probably a little less in terms of because you can only carry what you can carry, sure. but you're going to make that trip much more often and you're going to over time spend a lot more money. I think get, we're, get we're back on the bike, I think then. more and more trains are coming in so yeah. it's going to get busier and busier. Let's do it. <laughs> all protected roundabouts. Uh, bicycles are given priority because it's found that it doesn't it doesn't impact the flow of the cars yeah. uh, to that great extent, but is the safest treatment for all everyone using the space. Motorists are really uh, pretty uh, cautious of cyclists over here. Yeah, I mean, there's two reasons for that. One, their insurance deems them at fault if they hit a cyclist <laughs> yeah. automatically. But then they're also probably ride a bike themselves. I mean, 70% uh, of Dutch adults cycle at least once a week. It's uh, an amazing road safety tool when that many people yeah. are getting on a bicycle so they can uh, really empathize. It does perhaps create more empathy for our like fellow humans, right? No, 100%. And I think it... it Getting more people on foot and bicycle accomplishes two things. It gets you outside of your socio-economic bubble so that you're exposed to people you maybe otherwise wouldn't encounter driving from your house to the office and back yeah. again. But then it forces you to cooperate with your fellow road users. Every intersection, you're, you're forced to make eye contact, body gestures, uh, figure out who's going to yield to who, and uh, I think over time, this culture of trust has built because you have to trust the cyclist to move in a predictable way. That's really interesting, way. right? And you, and you also recognize that fundamentally you generally can trust other people, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you could measure happiness in, in general, it's, it's, it's people often look at, at the Dutch as being one of the happier cultures and societies out there. And I wonder if in part it's about the connection, not trying to just remove every little discomfort of life <laughs> away. I mean, yeah. in America, it's like I feel like we build our lives to be as comfortable as possible, but perhaps that's not actually the best way to live or, or to be happy, really. You're not made of sugar is a very famous Dutch <laughs> expression. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, because they will get out and, and, and ride in almost any weather, yeah. especially the kids. The kids are from a very early age, are exposed to the elements and taught to be resilient. I think this is, this is part of the happiness puzzle that we're trying to put together is the freedom and independence, of course, but the, the exposure to their, their neighborhood and their city and the people around them is hugely important when we're developing as small children. Living in, in Canada and then moving here, but I'm just interested to know on your happiness and quality life changes in, in this regard. Yeah, well, that was that was really the inspiration behind the book because I think moving here, we had full expectations that our quality of life would change. And it's part of the reason that we wanted to move in the first place. And I think what happened was we got here and we were, even us knowing better, we're surprised. So our kids seemed happier for the most part, aside from, you know, the fact that they're teenagers. So, sure. you know, you get what you get with that. <laughs> <laughs> but we both felt happier and less stressed and, just more connected as well. Like we met our neighbors very quickly yeah. because the built environment allowed us to go outside and, and meet everyone. And even for me as a woman, like no longer feeling alone when I was out on the cycle routes mm. or feeling like every time I stepped on my bike, I was making some sort of political statement. You know, people on bikes and people walking and such, it's more eyes on the street. If you're riding a bike, you're seeing things, you're experiencing things, you're hearing things mm -hmm. uh, in, on, a, on a totally different level. It's not just about living in a great place for cycling, yeah. but it's about living in a great place that makes everyone happier and healthier and 
you know, we're, I, we often point to the fact that we're living in a mental health epidemic, right. but we're not doing enough from our built environment to address that. Whenever yeah. you start talking about cycling and, and specifically cycling in the Netherlands, the first thing you always hear is, yeah, well, that's fine, but what happens when I have to get my kids to school, do some grocery shopping, right. or what about the elderly, or what about the disabled? And because they've never seen <laughs> or experienced uh, those possibilities in their everyday lives. And, and all we have to do is through our words, our photography and our film, show them what's possible, uh, what can be done. I'm gonna, I'm gonna park her right here. Prospect Park in Brooklyn was a big example of this. So yeah. the, the west side of Prospect Park, is, it was very disputed, you know, it, it, they can put in this protected bike lane. A large percentage of the community were against the infrastructure improvements. And, and then, you know, it ended up going through anyway because it was too much of a safety issue. Safety, you've just mentioned, has got to be a key metric. We, we've accepted that tens of thousands of people will die on our roads. This, from a global perspective. <laughs> from yeah. a global yeah, perspective. Sure. If this were the airline industry or the maritime industry or the rail industry, you know, would there be calls for overhaul and, 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 and change? But because it's the, the road network, we just kind of accept it as collateral damage and we move on for fear of inconveniencing cars. That has to change. I guess it's that, you know, like the serenity prayer, you accept the things you cannot change and you change the things you can. And, mm -hmm. and people just accept that as if you can't change that. Yeah. But, but that's what you guys are helping to share, that yeah, there are other ways to do that. Mm -hmm. Again, you wouldn't know, but uh, this is actually a continual green light for pedestrians and cyclists. They oh, cool. always have the right of way. And then uh, the car has to quote unquote beg for permission to cross the street. So they trigger a sensor on either side. Then the light goes red and the car can get through. So it's completely inverse of the way that we generally build our, our intersections in cities. And the reasoning for that is that uh, some 30,000 students come through or professors, whoever comes through this intersection a day. So to stop them would be into completely inefficient right. for the number of cars that are actually moving through. So because wow. it's not always the case that people, you know, drive a car because they want to. They drive a car because sometimes that's faster or more comfortable or whatever. But yeah. if you actually make accommodations for the other modes, yeah, you can start to realize those benefits. As a species, we're not idealistic in our mobility choices. We just pick the most practical means and it's often based on time. Yeah. So if you make the car the fastest way to get around the city, more people are gonna use it. All right, so we were talking a little bit before about making things safer for cyclists and pedestrians. A topic that seems to always come up here in the Netherlands is about bike helmets. I have my own perspective on it and I know a lot of different people have different perspectives on the topic. But I'm wondering what, what your thoughts or what your experience is. There's so much to say on this topic. It's very, and it's a very passionate and nuanced discussion. Elsewhere in the world, we're told that the bike helmet is the most important thing we can do for cycling safety. And I think the Netherlands has actually proved that the opposite is true. Societies with the lowest helmet usage, here it's about 0.5% of cyclists wear a helmet. So it's one in every 200 cyclists actually have the highest levels of safety, safety in the engineering and the infrastructure, safety in behavior, safety in numbers, rather than safety in personal protective equipment. The results speak for themselves. The Netherlands has the lowest cycling fatality rate per kilometer cycled in the world, despite the lowest helmet usage rate in the world, because they've seen the helmet as a distraction. They've seen a helmet as a counterproductive message that tells you that getting on a bicycle is dangerous, and they see the helmet as potentially stopping certain demographics from cycling, teenagers, the elderly, and if just a certain percentage of cyclists stop cycling or cycle less frequently because of this pressure to wear a helmet, then society loses out on all these amazing benefits that it would otherwise get from a public health perspective, from reduced congestion, from improved livability. I think the Netherlands proves that you can't have cycling safety without the safety equipment the safety actually lies in the street design and your traffic safety policies. Can we get through? It's a bit of a busy spot. Yeah. Okay. We can walk it. Yeah. Okay. Wow. This is something, huh? All right. So, so what is this considered here? So this is the, the Hotmarkt, or the main square of the city. Okay. So on Thursdays and Saturdays, this is where our, our market takes place. So this will be filled with oh, cool. vendors and such. You know, Christmas time, there's 
in normal times there's a big festival when they light the tree or King's Day which is the king's birthday, everyone has a day off, and there's a big celebration here as well. So it's like a very much a gathering space. It's the living room of the city. Yeah. Uh, and we have the old city hall building on one side, and the, the new kirk, uh, the new church on the other, which is actually where the royal family of the Netherlands is buried underneath. Wow. Delft as it is, is where the Netherlands, as we know it today, the kingdom of the Netherlands is started. So, oh, wow. Yeah. When you come here, you feel like it, it's always been this way, but in fact, uh, 16 years ago, <laughs> this was a surface parking lot. This was filled with cars. Just parking. Uh, yeah, yeah. And much of the city center was still accessible by motor vehicle. It took a political coalition between uh, three or four different parties, a single vote margin <laughs> wow. that made the entire city center auto loo or low car, uh, that restricted um, motor vehicle entry to residents, freight and service vehicles only. Um, and then, as a result, you know, we get this, this sense that uh, while well, this place was returned to its former gl glory, that it, it was always this way, but uh, yeah. it was, in fact, not that long ago. And it was one of those cases where it started with a bit of a, like a pilot idea. So these patios that you see here for these uh, restaurateurs, uh, at that time, they weren't here. And mm. then the city said, well, we'd like to build patios. There was like, well, we're not the Mediterranean. We can't have patios. So even here, there, we are not this place, is the right, argument. Right. Yeah. So they said, well, why don't you, we'll trial it. And so they kept some of the parking and then they had the patios. And the patios were such a success over here that the businesses on this side wanted it. And that helped to become the compelling case for removing the cars altogether. It's interesting in you say that because this is something that's <laughs> happening throughout the world as a result of COVID, right? Where mm -hmm. they're having, the, the, you know, this outside dining yeah. and stuff like that in places that maybe they wouldn't ever consider it. And in this case, you know, it, it took a political coalition to make this work. But 15 or 20 years later, I don't think anybody would want to go back to the, the car-dominated status quo that existed before that. Yeah. And of course, this place is very idyllic and, and just, you know, so much history and beautiful buildings and architecture. But for a newer city environment, it's not really all that much different. You know, people do just generally enjoy being able to walk around and not be worried that they're yeah. going to get run over <laughs> exactly. or something like that. And I think if this was just filled with parking, it wouldn't really yeah. give that, yeah. that sort of yeah. experience. So many cities have given away their most valuable real estate yeah. on the water, in the public squares. Where the uh, train was buried, there's also underground parking. And so that's where, if you're coming to visit the city center, that's where you park. But it's no, by no means you know, this car-free utopia. It's just the cars are kept at a distance from the city center, uh, which is reserved for, yeah social and economic activity as it really should be. Mm -hmm. I guess you think about it, people have to walk by more businesses exactly. to get to. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you guys so much for showing us around your new fine city here. And uh, I hope we get an opportunity to do this again because there's definitely so much more to talk about. You guys also have just tons of content. Maybe you want to just tell people like where they can find more of your stuff. So our two books, the first one, which came out in 2018, is Building a Cycling City, the Dutch Birth Blueprint for Urban Vitality. And the second is Curbing Traffic, which came out uh, earlier this year, The Human Case for Fewer Cars in Our Lives. You can get them uh, directly from our publisher, which is Island Press, or buy them anywhere online. I often advocate for trying to find a, a local bookseller who will definitely bring the books in for you, if you yeah. ask. Yeah, that's a good, yeah. good strategy. I like that. So that's one way to learn about some of what, well, a lot of what we were traveling through today. Fairly active on the social medias these days, uh, at Modacity Life. Melissa and Chris Bruntlett, uh, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. And then with our respected day jobs, you know, we're, we're working quite hard on transferring these, these concepts and ideas to cities around the world, myself with the Dutch Cycling Embassy. And if your city is interested, yeah, in, in, in talking to some Dutch experts about uh, a workshop, a study tour, uh, or need resources to, to help uh, further these conversations, they should definitely get in touch. I work for Mobicon, which is a member of the Dutch Cycling, cycling Embassy. Okay. Um, but we're a consultancy uh, with offices in North America, and we work uh, globally as well. And our role is to promote sustainable mobility. So we work as planners, policy advisors, designers, people working in communications and engagement, all to help bring a lot of the ideas and best practices from the Netherlands to cities around the world yeah. and apply them in context, which we talked a lot about today. But yeah, it's really taking those ideas and finding the best way to fit them into the cities where we're working. Yeah, because I, I think the point that I've gotten to is that yeah, it doesn't really make sense to do it alone, you know, that there are proven best practices. There's been some trial and error that's already happened here in <laughs> many ways, and it seems the direction of many cities are going in this way. Uh, so 
yeah. yeah let's try to figure out what works and, and learn from others that you know have been studying this and I appreciate you guys sharing all your experience today and I'm sure others do I personally am gonna try to continue to understand it so I can better convey this message as I talk and explore different places I, I guess I just got to ask and, and, and someone in closing do you guys plan to stay uh, yes <laughs> All being well, barring any major changes, our intent is to stay. We bought a house. We're feeling very settled. Okay. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so we specifically wrote the last chapter of our book, our latest book, about aging in place and, and the idea of building an aging, age-friendly city for people in their 70s and 80s and their twilight years yeah. to still get to live in the neighborhoods they grow up in, to be able to participate in society, and, and we think Delft is a model for a city that allows its residents to age in place. So as we get older, we feel quite comfortable that we're going to be able to stay here. We're going to enjoy the benefits that, that this city uh, offers to its eldest residents as we grow older and grayer. So I guess that means I could hopefully come to visit for years to come <laughs> yeah, as well. Yeah, exactly, huh? exactly. <laughs> All right, awesome. Well, thank you guys again. Mm -hmm. You've been so kind with your time and really appreciate it and just so knowledgeable about these things. Th oh, thanks yeah. again. Thanks for visiting. Our pleasure. Yeah. Awesome. Cheers. Thank you.